Hey everyone, this is Joe. Uh, you are about to hear episode 103 of the Decahedron RPG cast. In this episode, I am joined by Jason, and we're going to do a review of the Tunnel Quest RPG. But before I do that, I just wanted to talk about our upcoming giveaway. Uh, the episode was pre-recorded and the giveaway didn't exist at that time. So um, what's happening is I am giving away... It's censored because telling you what I'm giving away would ruin the whole contest, for lack of a better word. But anyway, so what we're doing is I developed this silly little RPG called Shirts and Skirts. And I'm going to talk about that in a future episode with Daniel from the Bandit's Keep RPG. And if you call in and tell me what you think Shirts and Skirts is about, <laughs> of all the people that call in and tell me what they think it's about, right or wrong, I'm going to select one of those people to win that secret thing that I talked about. Uh, it's related. So yeah, I need your entries by Friday, December 15th, like the, the end of the day. So when Saturday uh, the 16th comes around, that's when Daniel and I are going to record. And like I said, tell me what you think it's about and you might win. And here is a little hint. If you listened to last week's episode, there was another hint there. So here is this hint. All right. Did that help you? Did that, did you think you knew what it was last week, but now this one confused you? <laughs> Whatever. These are really esoteric hints, by the way. Uh, if you've ever watched The Masked Singer, they're like hints like The Masked Singer hints are. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, let's get started. Hi, I'm Joe. And this is the Decahedron RPG Podcast. Hi, everyone. This is Joe, and this is a Thanksgiving episode of the Decahedron RPG Podcast. And um, because it's Thanksgiving, this episode is actually going to drop on Tuesday instead of Wednesday. That way, if anyone's doing any long-distance travel, um, you can have it loaded up before you start your travel. But anyway... I have a special guest today, and the guest is none other than the ever so prolific Jason from the Nerds RPG Variety Cast. Hi, Jason. Hi. Thank you for having me on. Oh, no. Thanks. Thank you so much for being with me. And the reason I asked you to join me is that, well, A, this is another review episode. And whenever I do reviews, I like to have a second voice because it's good to hear uh, two opinions on any product, I feel. Well, at least two. Uh, and secondly, the product that we are reviewing is the Tunnel Quest RPG. And the very first time you ever contacted me, we got into a conversation about Tunnel Quest. And you hadn't heard of it up until that point. And I pointed you where to find it and stuff. And uh, you said it might even show up on one of your system Sundays, but it has not of yet. And I thought, huh, I'll just have you on the show to talk about it. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's an interesting system. I'm looking forward to this review. Well, abbreviated review. This is kind of like the top three and bottom three, right? As opposed to a detailed review. Yeah, that, that, that's the way I normally do my uh, reviews. You know, hit the high points and the, quote, low points. And uh, I should also point out that for me, at least, and I believe for you, this is one of those reviews. This is one of those, like, read-only reviews because I've never actually got the chance to sit down with this and play it although I desperately want to, so that's kind of a spoiler on how this review is going to end out on my part. But yeah, I actually haven't sat down at the table with it yet. Yeah, I was kind of surprised. We have a Tunnels and Trolls game in the future that we're supposed to be playing. I was a little surprised you didn't suggest we use these rules instead, although I know Daniel wants to try Tunnels and Trolls pretty badly. Yes. So anyway, just to give everyone a little heads up about what this is, this is a game called Tunnel Quest. It's a, it's a free game. Uh, it came out in, well, it came out in 2008, but that was the first version. The version that we are reviewing is version 3.52, which came out in 2011. 
It was written by a gentleman named uh, Mike Hill. He goes by the name of Hogscape online. He's from Perth, Australia. And um, that almost made me not review this, uh, if I'm going to be honest. Mike Hill is probably best known as being one of the co-creators of Tunnels and Trolls version 6, which is a completely illegal, unlicensed, unethical, in my opinion, version of Tunnels and Trolls. Uh, it's just that he and this other guy who shall remain nameless sat down and released on their own. And they didn't even like do like the rules and call it something else. They just called it Tunnels and Trolls uh, version six. And there's even a snide little note in there that said like, hey, Flying Buffalo, we got there first. Yeah, that almost made me not want to do this. But I know that the two writers of Tunnels and Trolls version six made peace with Ken St. Andre and Rick Loomis at some point. And, you know, they, they called it Water Under the Bridge, and they even worked on some other officially licensed Tunnels and Trolls products. But then the other guy, who, again, I'm not going to mention, went completely off the rails and uh, was doing all sorts of unlicensed products like he would find other people's products and start selling them and he was lifting artwork from everywhere and he was just he was being complete troll about it so that almost made me not want to do this except i looked and i couldn't find anyone else ever saying anything bad about mike hill it was only bad stuff about the other guy so that's why i said yeah i, I can go ahead and do this there's also credit to a gentleman named uh, Paul Elliott. He is best known for a game called Zenobia, but he has a bunch of other stuff. If you go to his website, I'll throw a link in the web, uh, in the show notes. But the reason he gets credit is that he originally wrote a little game called Dragons, and Mike Hill saw that, and this is based on that, and he specifies with permission. So cool. Uh, I already said that it was free. Uh, where you can find this is there is this site called 1km1kt.net, uh, which is dedicated to a whole bunch of free games. The name itself stands for 1,000 Monkeys, 1,000 Typewriters, you know, going with that old uh, adage that, you know, if you take 1,000 monkeys and you give them 1,000 typewriters, they'll eventually produce, you know, all the works of literature. So if you look there, you can find version 3.5. The version we're reviewing is 3.52, which in hindsight, I should have probably just said, let's review version 3.5. That's harder to find. Uh, Mike Hill used to have a Google site, uh, and it was available on there. That site has since vanished, and with it 3.5, you can still find it if you look in enough places. But really, the only difference between 3.5 and 3.52 is that 3.52 adds a campaign location in the back, which, yeah, whatever. And he has uh, about five paragraphs about how to handle hirelings. And really, that's the only differences. And I'm not going to say anything about either of those items. So it really uh, doesn't matter uh, that we're re re reviewing 3.52 instead of 3.5. Uh, I think the only other thing I have to say is that the product is uh, 50 pages, at least 3.52 is. I'm, I'm sure that 3.5 is a little shorter. Out of that, I would say about, actually, it's almost about a 50-50 split. About uh, 25 pages of that is actual, the game, and then the other 25 pages are appendices with like sa sample uh, foes and that campaign setting I was telling you about and uh, stuff like that. The next thing I was going to do was uh, a little summary about how the game works itself. But before I go there, did, did I leave anything out? Did anything you wanted to say about the product? No, I think we'll cover it as we talk, and you're going to cover the real basics of the game. So I think we'll be good. The only other thing I'll mention is the the website, the MS, I forget the abbreviation now, but the for the Monkeys of the Typewriters, that's also where Barbarians Lemuria first appeared. The oh, initial I didn't version know of that. that. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of good stuff on there, and uh, yeah, I it's a great site just to go and check out. And sadly, it's not as active as it was, but yeah, it's it's a great site. And actually, it's going to come up again when we talk about the stuff. Um, but so yeah, the game itself. This is the part I always forget to talk about whenever I do one of these reviews: is how does the game work? And I'm going to do some reading from the book itself, and then I have just a note or two to add in. I'll probably add them in as we go along. So the first thing 
the game says is that it's the referee never needs to make a die roll. The turn of events is determined by the player's actions. As Jason always says, that means it's completely player facing. Yeah. And I believe that it's true. Second thing it says that is that each round of combat is resolved with a one die roll per player. It's almost a very, um, probably the, the, the most well-known game that uses it in the fantasy genre, at least would be dungeon world powered by the apocalypse where you know you make your roll and if you succeed at your roll you hit the opponents if you fail at your roll the opponents hit you the the only difference is that powered by the apocalypse uh has that in between zone where you can see succeed, uh, succeed at a cost again that's going to come up on my list so um <laughs> small numbers um yeah they are small numbers it's not like uh in 3e D D, where sometimes you're like adding like plus 72 bonuses or something like that. This game is heavily inspired by Tunnels and Trolls. And one of the places where that shows is that enemies are required by one simple statistic. In Tunnels and Trolls, it's called a monster rating. Here they call it a foe rating and require no record keeping. That's really, yeah. If you want to make a monster, you just say foe rating 17. That's it. The next thing it says is no defined attributes. Uh, choose your character's talents and abilities from a list or create your own. So yeah, nice open-ended thing. If you want to make a ranger-y type character, just say he's a ranger, and that becomes an attribute. Simple incremental character advancement. Yeah, whatever. Uh, an easy-to-use magic system with plenty of options and over 70 spells. Spoiler, we will be talking about that in a little bit. It says that it's a breeze to adopt to public settings and inventors because it's such a streamlined uh, rules-light system. Uh, you can focus more on the story than uh, the mechanics. And he finally says that it's uh, designed for traditional face-to-face -face play and remote play-by-post games. Uh, yep. And again, because it's so rules light and because you only ever have that one die roll, yeah, you don't have to, like, you know, play-by-post. You don't have to wait for the DM to then make another roll and do all that fun stuff. And then the only other thing I'm going to say, he doesn't say anything. This is a class-based system, a lot like... The, the, yeah, a lot like D&D &D, or a lot like Tunnels and Trolls and very much like Tunnels and Trolls because the classes are Warrior, Wizard, and Rogue, which are the same three classes in Tunnels and Trolls and they mean the same three things here. Anything else for the summary, sir? Uh, I think we'll talk about it in our pros and cons. So, no, I, I think that's good. I think it is important to to point. Well, no, I, let's do the pros and cons. I, I, I think we'll capture any other comments I have in there. Okay. Well, then I've been doing a lot of talking, so I am going to toss it to you. So as we do our uh, reviews here in Decahedron, we do the top three things that we like the best, and then we talk about the bottom three things that we like the least, and then we do like an overall thumbs up, thumbs down on the game. I think I've already telegraphed what I'm going to say, but I've been doing a lot of talking, so we will throw it to you. What is your favorite, best, happiest thing about the game? Okay. Now, these are not necessarily in order. But one of the pros of this game, a good thing of this game, is the magic system, which is complete with the counterspell ability. The magic system is very interesting. It allows you to even, so there, you have the ability to counter other people's magic, and you can actually put, it uses magic points, it's not fancy, and, and you can actually spend extra magic points to make it harder to counter a spell that you cast, which I really like. And the magic system is based around colors, and the different spells, when you cast them, have different environmental effects. So if you cast a, a red spell, the temperature might rise in, this, in the area or something like that. It's a really interesting system, a little bit different, but very evocative. And I think it'd be a lot of fun in play. Um, so this is normally where I would chime in and tell you my thoughts about what you just said. But I'm going to not say anything about that. And people who know how, that sh uh, how this show works probably knows what that means. Uh, so instead, I'm going to say the first thing I like, the thing I like the best is the aspect of it that being completely player facing. This is the first time I'd ever seen this. And like I said, it shows up now in Apocalypse World and powered by all the powered by the Apocalypse games. That's that's their core mechanic. But this this was published two years before Apocalypse World became a thing. So this is, as far as I know, this is the first place that does it. And like I said before, no matter what you're trying, if you're trying to, actually, we see a lot in D&D, &D, right? You know, if you, I'm trying to climb a wall, so you roll the dice, and if you make it, you make it. If you don't, you don't. 
but that even works in combat, right? And so if you're facing multiple foes, you know, I'm going to try to hit them. You roll your dice. Yay, you made it. And there's no need to roll again for the foes because you made it. It's, it's understood. I mean, in combat, you're not only trying to hit the enemy, you're trying to avoid being hit by them. And so if you make it, it assumes that both of those are true. And if you fail, it assumes that necessarily the opposite is true. Whereas in D&D, you will have a lot of those rounds where you miss, the monster misses, you miss, the monster misses, and a whole bunch of nothing's happening. That never happens. And it's a mechanic. I, I love it. I adore it. And this is the first place I've ever seen it. Uh, the only thing I would say that Powered by the Apocalypse improves, uh, I talked about it before, is Powered by the Apocalypse has that little middle ground where if you roll there, um, you say, yes, you succeed, but at a cost. And I always make that an option. Uh, would you accept a bad thing to succeed? Um, and I, I was talking about climbing the wall before. So you might say, uh, yeah, you climbed the wall, but it took you longer than you expected. And there's a bad guy up there waiting for you now or something like that. Or when you get to the top, you drop your pack, whatever. And that would be easy enough to add as a house rule for this, you know, miss by one, you get to choose a bad thing. Uh, any thoughts about the completer fa com uh, player facing aspect of it? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, now that I think about it, I'm not sure that I know of a game that's completely player facing prior to 2011 either. I'll have to go back and look. But this th this may be the earliest one that I've come across as well. I, I didn't put two and two together pr prior to you mentioning that. I do like the player facing aspect, and I agree with you. It would be great for a play by post. It would really speed that up and make that go well, it, as well as you know, at the table, if you're going to do a one shot or if you only have a two hour time block, or even if you're going to play over the lunch hour, you, you know, this would be a great, great game for that. Yeah. I, th I think the only th other thing I'll add about it is that I think this is the aspect of the game that Mike Hill got from Paul Elliott in uh, Dragons, which I would look high and low for Paul Elliott's Dragons and I can't find it anywhere. Um, so if anybody out there can find it, shoot me a link because I'm very interested. But yeah, so I think that was the thing that was in Dragons that inspired this game. All right, so that was my number one, your number one. What is your number two, sir? We're going to go with the character creation. And you've already kind of hit the, the reasons that's so great. But yes, technically it's a class-based game, but the rogues are so open-ended that you know you can make a fighter magic user, you can make a total explorer kind of, you know, skill monkey kind of character that doesn't necessarily use magic, but just has talents. And I think talents are what make this work so well. So maybe I'm cheating here by squeezing two things in, but the, the character creation, including the talents, really let you make any character you can think of with, you know, a little bit of a maneuvering around here. Uh, we didn't mention talents before. But talents are basically like one word skills or almost like they're not they're not as open ended as say cliches and, and recess, but they're basically, you know, you have archer or sailor or something like that, or or maybe sword fighting. And it, it but it lets you build pretty much any kind of character you can think of if you're a little bit creative with it. Yeah, the, the example I gave when I was uh given the overview of the system was ranger, right? And so I think that would uh, subsume things like uh, wilderness skills and tracking and stuff like that. You could also say paladin, right? And that would just, uh, sort of include in it holy things, you know? But yeah, that's things I would look at. And it's funny that you say that because the character system is also my number two item on my list. And for all the reasons you said, I love the talent system. I love that it's open-ended, but I also love that they give you a list because as I've talked about before, when Evil Jeff and I were reviewing Rhesus, yeah, um, was with no list of cliches. Uh, some players find that openness to be overwhelming. And so with the list, you could always say, okay, just pick something on the list. And I think that would be uh, great from them. Um, the character generation system is fast. When you pick your class, each class has its own number. So the three stats that the characters have are the number of hits, which are your hit points, just like it says, uh, the number of talents you have and the number of spells you have, the number of magic you have. And when you pick a class, it tells you exactly how many of each of those you have. And then you have the option to move one from one of them to the other. 
that's it. And then your, your, your character is done. Well, then you go buy equipment and stuff, but it even says that you start off with certain equipment. You know, every character has certain equipment on their own, which again is brilliant. The only thing I looked at, you know, cause when you pick a fighter and because fighters can't have any magic, that means there's really only three different possible types of fighters, right? Cause you can move one of your hits to your talents, or you can move one of your talents to your hits, or you can do none of those. I went through all the possibilities, and that means there's only really 15 distinct possibilities for uh, variations uh, based on class and stats, um, which might sound constricting, but because you have that open-ended talent system, just like Jason was saying, that is really where all the differences come in, and that's where your character ceases to become numbers and becomes a thing, a, a unique snowflake, if you will. So we agreed on that one. What's your number three, sir? We may not agree on this one. And again, I'm going to cheat here a little bit, but this is a the value of the game. This is a complete game for free. So the value, no matter what you get, is pretty good. But it's well laid out. It, now, there's no art here, but which is a plus in your book, I'm sure. But, you know, the two-column layout, the way it's laid out is really easy to read. It's, it's very easy to parse. But you not only get a complete game with all the rules, you get a set, a mini setting, you get an adventure, and you get the character sheet in here. So you get everything you need. And then we also reviewed, we haven't talked about it, but there's another PDF that you sent me, Tunnel Quest Foes, which gives more examples of bad guys. Now, there are examples of monsters in the main book as well. But you, you really have a complete game here that you can just pick up and run with and you don't have to use their setting but it, i think it's nice to give that because some people do like included settings so i don't think there's a negative to it being here I, I would kind of disagree with that last part i would like the include setting just to be a whole separate book so if you want it here it is um same thing with the adventure i i don't like those things cluttering up the the book but yeah you know that's that's me i know i'm different it's funny that you say that about the artwork because i actually had a note and i guess i erased it that said i think this has the perfect amount of artwork <laughs> <laughs> it, it actually does have one illustration which is in the sample campaign it has a little map and there's a couple logos on the front page we'll talk about those as well but yeah, so not only doesn't it have art, but you don't go through it saying it needs art either. You know, you're you're not feeling like like you're missing it. Yeah, it is free. I I originally had that on my notes for the good things, but I had too many other good things, so I just threw it in as in, uh, under the explanation of the game. It, it is complete. It's twenty pages, like I said, the uh, twenty five. The, the appendices add another twenty five, but they're not really needed. And it's a complete game. And even out of the twenty five, a lot of those are spell descriptions. So, yeah, this is it's really good. I think that's an excellent point, and I agree with it completely. Uh, my number three is the combat system. We already talked about it, so there's not a whole lot to talk about. But it's actually kind of funny because when I was looking for this, I was like, wow, there's a lot of Lucky 7 in here. And I'm wondering if this is where I got those ideas to put into Lucky 7. Like one of the things I struggled with in Lucky 7 a lot was hit points and how am I going to handle hit points? Because I don't want these big numbers and I want things to be kind of abstract and everything. And the thing I settled on, and I thought I arrived at it independently because I thought I was like, oh, I'm going to do it like video games do it. And you have this many lives. But that's exactly how Tunnel Quest does it. Only they call them hits. And you don't have a big number. You have like maybe I think it's three of your magician and six or so of your warrior. I am going by fuzzy memory. I could have those numbers wrong. But, you know, it's not a lot. And foes generally have three. And, you know, so when you score the hit, it goes from three to two or yours goes from six to five. And that's what you're really keeping track of. The other thing to fall into the combat system is uh, weapons, because, of course, you're only doing one point of damage. All weapons do the same, almost like original D&D in the way I feel it should be. Uh, so you're not rolling for damage every time. You just you do the hit or not. And uh, armor, inspired by the earliest editions of Tunnels and Trolls, I think. Mm, actually, it's kind of a hybrid. So armor in your shield really just gives you more hits. And like in the first editions of Tunnels and Trolls, they were just more hits. And every time it got hit, it was gone. And so you had like a shield worth three hits. It, after one combat, if it took three hits, that shield was destroyed. In later 
versions of Tunnels and Trolls, it was worth three hits every single round and whatever. In this one, um, it's worth three hits every combat. So every, I would say, not like a w opponent, opponent, every combat scene, you know, every battle. And so once your shield takes those three hits and then once your armor takes however many hits of armor you have, that's when you start taking hits. But after the combat, your shield and armor are good again, except there is an optional rule one I would probably use because Jason says I'm a mean GM. <laughs> and that is uh, whenever your armor has been damaged or whatever, you roll some dice and on a certain result, you say, yeah, that damage is permanent for that piece of armor or one of them is and i would probably do that but yeah all these things i think it would make for a very fast flowing uh fast and furious as they say a uh, combat system uh and still be narratively interesting and a lot of fun any comments on the comment uh comment system sir yeah so i think because of the mean gm comment we should point out here that one change from tunnels and trolls or one thing that's different i mean obviously this is inspired but not exactly like tunnels and trolls is that in this case the referee is the one who decides who gets if you have two opponent if you have two player characters or what well, doesn't matter if you have two opponents fighting one opponent that one opponent is only going to be able to injure one of the two people attacking them and in this case the referee decides who gets hit out of the group as opposed to normally in tunnels and trolls the group would get to decide who's going to take those hits hmm yeah, I, I I miss that, and I'm trying to decide like if I'm wearing my GM hat, how I would handle that. Uh, it would either have to go narratively, you know, based on how everything was described, and there's no clear answer there. I think I would just roll a die, you know, odd even, you know, Fred or Jack. Yeah, yeah. It, but what it does is it stops the. It doesn't necessarily stop because if they, like you say, it's narrative. So if the if you have a fighter and a wizard, and the fighter is describe the warrior is describing, I'm protecting the wizard. I'm staying between them then it would make sense for them to be hit. But it, you know, in normal tunnels and trolls, of course, the fighters, the tanks can absorb those hits automatically because the or not automatically, but because the way the rules are written. And I, I would point out that's owning certain uh, versions of tunnels and trolls up to version five, I think. <laughs> um, it was assumed that it was just evenly divided amongst everyone. And I think it was right. version yeah. seven where they started saying, you know, players can divide it any way they want. No, no, that's accurate. The I, I get in the older versions, any leftover if, if it didn't divide equally, any leftover points the players could decide yes. where they go. All right. So those were the things we liked. Let's uh put on our little slightly negative hat. And again, I like to point out that when we say that these are the things we like the least, that's not necessarily saying anything bad about the game. For every game, there's no perfect game out there. Uh, lucky seven won't even be perfect when it's out there. Um, you know, everything has high points and low points, and those are even different for depending who you're talking to because different players have different styles. That's always why I like a second voice on here. And uh, different people like different things. And this is just to give you our thoughts on this one thing. Again, we're not saying anything objectively is bad. Uh, with all that disclaimer, sir, what is your uh, first item on your list of the least liked aspects? That is an abandoned game, uh, which is sad. It's not now. It's a the good thing is, like I said in my pros, it's a complete game, so you can pick it up and play it. So it's not the end of the world. But there, it seems to be totally abandoned, totally left behind. There's even on RPG Geek, there's a thread last year. Somebody was looking to see if anything else had ever happened with this, or not not last year, in 2022. But yeah, it, it the game seems to be, you know, this is what you have. So if you want any additional content, you're definitely going to have to make it yourself because it seems to be, you know, a, de a dead game, quote unquote. Right. Yeah. So it's actually, yeah, I, I saw that link on RPG uh, Geek 2. And um, what's interesting is that Mike Hill is active on RGP.net uh, uh, and his name there is Hogscape. And yeah, and he didn't reply. And so I was like, hmm. Um, so yes, I will agree with you that this is a dead game. I will disagree with you as to whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. I actually like games that are discontinued. Like when I started playing Big Eye, Small Mouth, I went and made a point at that time, second edition was the edition that was out, 
And so I made a point to pick up all the first edition books because what I don't like is when I'm playing a game and then a new supplement or a new whatever comes out and it changes things in the, you know, and you've been playing along and now all of a sudden it's changed. And you're like, well, do I use a new rule? Do I use the... And uh, so sometimes I think being a quote unquote dead game is a good thing. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought to put that on my list. Uh, but, you know, again, that's get, that's the whole point of having two reviewers, right? What one person likes, another person doesn't. The first thing on my negative list, and this is uh, from the first thing on your positive list, was I don't think, you know, so this, the, the advertising blurb, if you will, said an easy to use magic system. And I don't find this magic, user, magic system as easy or um, intuitive as other systems. The spells are, actually, the spells are good. I like the spell list. Uh, he put some good work in there. Uh, but yeah, the whole thing about the colors of the magic and like gray is brain and red is damage and blue is movement. I forget what green is. And then there's a prismatic leap. I, that I found that kind of irritating, actually. I was like, well, if it's brain, just call it the, the mental school. You know, if it's damage, call it the combat school or the fire school. If it's movement, call it the, the transportation school. You know, use those tra traditional schools of magic. I would have preferred that. And the whole, how many points am I going to put into this? And there are some things that are sort of hinted at and aren't explained and, or they're not explained in a row and you have to kind of read here and then read there. But it's like when you pick your magic points, you get like say you have three points of magic, that means you can pick like three first level spells or one third level spell or a second level in a first level spell. But then those it has to correspond with the color. So each point of magic you have is actually a point in a color. And when you cast a spell, the recharge time is, I thought it was particularly long. It takes like six hours of rest to get your points back. And I would prefer a more TNT-like system where you get like one point back every 10 minutes. Uh, but again, that's easy enough to house rule. Comment, sir? No, I think those are all valid comments. So what is your number two thing on your least uh, favorite things? So I'm going to say I'm not overly fond of games that were the, and this is going to be counterintuitive, think of the games I like, but games where your your game master has to set the difficulty number. And, and this is a game where, where that's required. And the advice, and it actually gives pretty good advice in here on setting difficulty numbers and, and it spends some time on that at the very beginning of the rules but I, I'm not overly fond of of where the GM sets target numbers because depending on your GM that could you know they may not be very consistent let's say because of all my experience with fudge and I guess even before that with GURPS only instead of in GURPS instead of set, set in difficulty number you normally set it as a plus or minus uh, but yeah fudge you know it made it real easy because it's really easy to visualize a Again, I'm going back to my cliff example. You know, if I have to climb a cliff, I'm you're like, okay, you could say it. Even a moderate climbing a check would make that one. So I find that very intuitive. And so what I would normally do in a game like this is I make a little chart that has the fudge levels and a the corresponding number for the system next to them. Because I still think in those fudge terms. Um, so yeah, that didn't make my list one way or the other. I can see your point though. Yeah. Uh the next item on my list is the weird rogue combat bonus. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> rogues get a plus their level in during, when they're making their combat checks. But as soon as they get a, I think it's third point, it might be a fourth point in magic, that goes away. So if you want to learn a new spell, you need to you know get that new point in magic to get the spell. And that just creates this weird situation in my mind where... Okay, let's say you're a third level rogue, so you've been getting your your you know plus three in your combat roll every turn, and you gain a level, and you said, okay, I'm going to take another point in magic, and all of a sudden, because you learned a new spell, instead of getting a plus three, you get a plus zero in combat. It's like what that that spell made me lose, forget how to swing a sword, and then it gets even weirder, and it says the next time you gain a level, you can choose to get that back or something it's weird and i i didn't like that that would definitely cry out for a house rule for me uh this reminded me very much of the original od d style elf that we see also in like delving deeper basically once they get 
the third point of magic. Every level they have to choose. Are they going to be a fighter or are they going to be a wizard, a warrior or a wizard? And if they're a warrior, they can apply it towards the the combat. If they're a wizard, they're going to apply it towards spell casting roles. And, and you have to decide each level which you're going to emphasize. Because I'm because of the my familiarity with the older D and Ds where elves had this, you have to choose with for an elf. This wasn't a, a shocker to see that, and it, I kind of actually thought it was interesting that you get to choose and you can change your focus. But I can see why that could be um, disconcerting. Yeah, I, th I think the way I would do it as a house rule is rule. Yeah, house rule is to say, uh, you know, once you hit that level, every point after that, you choose where that goes. Yeah, I, I don't like the fact that it disappears, and it could be a pretty high bonus that just suddenly disappears because you decide to learn a new spell. But again, yeah, that's me. All right, sir, your number three least liked item. So this one is a kind of an odd one because it lies. In the, and the reason I'm getting giving odd ones is because it's a pretty darn good game. But the unified mechanic is a plus and a minus. I'm going to put forth the unified mechanic. The negative of that is without mini games for different things and all, this game is really simple. So for a two-hour block or an hour block, a quick game, this is great. If you're playing a more in-depth game, a, you know, for a lot of people, the mechanics just fall by the wayside, and that's wonderful. But there are other players out there, like our common friend Dan and Norton over Bandit's Keep, that would probably get bored with the system because Daniel's a big fan of mini games, you, you know, within their games. So for some players, the kind of unified mechanic here would be a negative. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with you at all on that. I, yeah, of course, Daniel has said many times on his show that he does not like unified mechanics. I, on the other hand, love unified mechanics. When I left D&D &D for GURPS, that is what attracted me to GURPS because everything in GURPS is roll 3d6 under your skill level. Bam, that's it. No matter what you're doing, that's it. And uh, I was like, yeah, this is the way it is. And let you just go with the story and go with the, okay, bam. And, you know, fudge, same way, right? You roll your 4df and move up and down the ladder. And uh, in my mind, for my type of game, it lets you just go on the story, go on what's happening in the world, and the other stuff falls aside. But yeah, again, uh, different people like different things. And I totally agree with you that some people might not like that. The last thing on my list, and this kind of ties in with what you said with it being a dead game, but it has a very ambiguous copyright license status. Uh. There is no copyright notice, none at all. But in the U.S., that means the default is that it's copyrighted because that's the way U.S. law works. Um, there's no license. It's not OGL'd. It's not anything. So it's all locked up, and it's a dead game. And like I said, I – spoiler again. I love this game, and I would love to take this very concept and do it with a space game or a Wild West game and – Okay, yeah, I can do that and do that around my table, no problem. But if I put that work into it, it would be awesome to be able to put that out there and make it available for people. And with the way it's written and everything, I don't feel I could legitimately, legally, ethically, morally do that. I suppose I could write my kill an email and ask him to be okay. I imagine he'd say yes, but I don't know. So yeah, and that and so that really, really bugs me. And this is the second review in a row where I've talked about copyright and license things. So I guess that is really one of my pet peeves. Um, but I will say something interesting that caught my eye on this. Just like you found that post on RPG.net, I said on the title page, there's two other little logos on it. One of them is the old, now controversial, you know, grid map uh -huh. OSR logo. And the other one is the shield that says, in philanthropy, we trust. And I was like, maybe that's a clue. Maybe that is a shield that they put on and it implies an OGL type thing or something. So I went looking for where that came from. And that came from something called the freerpgblog.net, run by a gentleman named Rob Lang. And so I found the post where he made those and it was very long ago. It's when like Swords and Wizard, Wizardry was up for the Ennies and he had made the first logo to say pretty much vote for the free games. And then he made this one to kind of replace that one, which is kind of cool. And on the same post where he has that 
uh, these images, he has like a link to his how to write a free RPG post. And so I said, oh, you know, I'm trying to write Lucky 7. That's a free RPG. Let me see if he, there's anything useful there. So you go there and he's talking about, yeah, this is how you do it. This is sections you need. And so, for example, I'm going to show you this game I'm developing. And this game is the Chicago Wiz, the RPG. And not Chicago like you would normally spell Chicago, but Chicago Wiz like exactly how Mike of the Dungeon Masters Handbook podcast spells Chicago Wiz. So Mike, if you're listening, I want to know why Rob Lang is making Chicago Wiz the RBG. But anyway, yeah, that's my item is ambiguous license slash copyright status. Yeah, I think that's a very valid one. And while Mike Hill is, I, I, I don't want to sound negative, but since my kill is still active and still around, it's probably better to reach out sooner rather than later to check for permission because things happen, right? And, and it'll be easier to get that permission while he's alive or while he's around. Yeah, I, th I think I should do that. Thanks. So any thoughts about Chicago Wiz, the RPG? I, I have not seen that. I would very much like to check that out. I'm sure it's an excellent RPG. And I hope Michael calls in and shed some light on that mystery. Yeah, I actually meant to send him an email before we recorded this to, to get some comment, but uh, I've just been really super, super busy. Um, all right, so we've uh, done the three we like, the three, three we like the least, which brings us to the overall. What is your overall opinion of the game, sir? I like it. I, I like it quite a bit, which probably explains why my three negatives were, you know, n not all that bad. Definitely a thumbs up. And again, I'm going to agree with you 100% there. My thumb is firmly up in the air with this one. I love this game. I really, really, really want to run it. I think I'm, I'm thinking about doing it for a, uh, a future episode as an actual play. It's a great game. And like Jason said, it's a complete free RPG in 25 slash 50 pages. Uh, you can easily point your players at the link at 1KM, 1KT. Um, which I find even easier than telling someone they have to go to drive through and create an account, even though they're not going to charge anything just to download something that's free. So many things I like about this game. So much I want to run about it. Run about it? You know what I'm saying. So, yes, the, I thumb way, way up. I love this game. So, Jason, thank you very much for joining me for this review. No, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. And everybody else, thanks for tuning in and listening. Uh, if you've ever encountered this game before, call in. Let, let me know what you think about it. If you know Mike Hill and think uh, he'd give me permission to update this, write in. Let me know. I'm, I'm going to have to contact him. Um, yeah, but like I said, links to for where to find it uh, will be in the show notes. Maybe I'll even link to the uh, Chicago Wiz, the RPG. <laughs> yeah, Mike, I really want to know about that. Yeah, if you have any comments, any, uh, any comments at all, Feel free to call the feedback line, feedback at deckhedron.com. There's always the play forums, www.deckhedron.com slash boards, which have been woefully inactive a bit in lately, by the way. I log even logged in today and I was going to do some stuff, but then uh, work summoned me and I had to do like the real stuff they pay me for, which seems fair, seeing that they're paying me. But yeah, there's the play forums. Of course, you leave all the slash boards. That's the Dekahedron website. It shows you all the ways to contact us. They're also in the show notes. Then the outro music that you're probably hearing right now. If you do hear this for Thanksgiving and you're in the US where that means something because Canadian Thanksgiving already happened, I believe, and uh, the rest of the world doesn't do that. So uh, have a happy Thanksgiving and safe travels if you are traveling. Um, and again, finally, Jason, uh, thank you one more time. Thank you. And everyone else, happy life, happy gaming. I think I got that backwards. Happy gaming, happy life. Bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Decahedron RPG cast. We'd love to hear from you. You can leave us a voice message by calling 562-774-2278. That's 562-RPG-CAST. Or by visiting sayhi.chat slash decahedron. You can also email us at feedback at decahedron.com. Links are in the show notes. For more information, visit decahedron.com. Remember that decahedron is spelled with a K. Music is by Kevin McLeod. Logo is by Design Cat. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, keep those dice rolling.